Hello, everyone. This is Brett Rogers, your host here on the Logos Evangelist Podcast Experience, a place where we come together to learn how to love God, love others, and make disciples. If that sounds like the kind of thing you'd be interested in, I'm glad to have you here. Stay tuned. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whenever it is that you're joining with me, it's good to have you here on the Logos Veritas podcast with me. My name is Brett Rogers. I'm your host. And without any further ado, uh, and I'm looking forward to getting into what it is that we're going to be talking about today, which is looking at Jesus and how he sees people, right? When he looks at the crowds, how does he see the crowds? When he looks at people, how does he see them? Is he... Frustrated, irritated, annoyed? How does he see those who are around him? Now, as somebody who's grown up, right, and I've worked in fast food, uh, busting tables and stuff, there are, you know, you get to where there's some customers that you like to have around, and there's other customers that you're like, you never tip, uh, we wait on you extravagantly, and uh, not only do you take advantage of that, but then you just don't, you don't express any gratitude or thanks at all. Um, well, you know, why don't you find somewhere else to eat? <laughs> well, we're going to take a look here at Jesus. We're going to dive into, um, pull up my program here. We're going to hop into, not Genesis, we're going to get there in just a second, but Matthew chapter 9, where Jesus, he's just gotten done healing this uh, man who's unable to speak, and we read in Matthew here in Verse 35, where we're told, And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. This is where he tells his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So what we're seeing here is that Jesus, he, he has compassion on the crowds. And why? Why does he have compassion on the crowds? Well, these are not the ones who are coming to him and trying to pull gotcha questions. That, hey, guess what? We're smarter than you are, Jesus. We know exactly what to say to get you to look terrible in front of everybody. This is honor-shame culture. So if you are found to not have an answer for something and you're silent, you can't respond, that's seen as a shameful thing and you lose honor in people's eyes. Um Instead, what happens when folks try to do that is that's how Jesus answers them, right? You get into that Hosea, uh, sow to the wind, reap the whirlwind kind of situation. But when, but these people are not coming to Jesus like that. They're coming to him uh, with faith, right, with trust that Jesus, we've seen these false messiahs that keep popping up left, right, and center that, hey, I'm the Messiah, watch me overtake Rome, and then get slaughtered in the process, Right? These people are harassed and helpless. They've they've got false gods, uh, idol worship all around them, in in all the Roman cities, and those even those who are in the priesthood. I believe it's Josephus that at this time it talks about how the the priesthood was taking part in um, in watching races and games and stuff and, and in Israel, but they were the Roman games and, and such, and that. The, the activities that would be going on at these things were were such that they would be made ritually unclean by attending and participating in what was going on, to the point that there weren't enough priests in the temple to be able to offer up the sacrifices, uh, to, uh, to be able to have people have their sins covered. That's pretty serious, right? This, this is a pretty dark time, and... So they're not having their they're not able to go and have their their sins cleansed at the temple like they need to be uh, because of compromise in in the priestly class 
they're not able to get help with how to follow God's law because even though they have a lot of people who know what the law is, uh, Jesus, one of his criticisms of the Pharisees uh, and and the teachers of the law is that you know the law and uh, you don't you know you pile on and you don't do anything. You don't lift a finger to help anybody be able to fulfill the law here. So he he gets on him about that. He sees the people coming to him and and you get the sense that they're like like sheep. Like if you've ever seen documentaries or you've maybe herded sheep or something, uh, and they've they've been harassed by predators. They're looking for a place to rest. They're coming to Jesus. All right, we've seen all this other stuff. We've we've got people in here who are sick, who are demon oppressed and possessed, uh, who you know we're dealing with all kinds of stuff here. Jesus, what do you have to offer that's anything different than what we've seen before? What's in this for you, Jesus? When he saw the crowds, verse thirty six, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. I'm going to switch over here to uh, in Matthew chapter 15, where Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion on the crowd because they've been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. Right. So these folks have been with him. They've been following him for a while. They've been listening to him, uh, absorbing his teaching, watching him in action. I'm like, man, there's something here. Like we're going to stay with him because we're going to miss something if we don't. He's what he's sharing here. These are he's sharing truth here and everyone's able to see it. He says, they've been with me three days and have nothing to eat. And I'm unwilling to send them away hungry lest they faint along the way. And this is where we get into Jesus feeds the 4,000, right? Um, And the disciples are like, well, how are we going to feed so many people and stuff? And, And Jesus says, well, you give them something to eat. Let's see here. We'll back this down to here. There we go. If you're listening, I'm adjusting the uh, I'm adjusting the Logos software I'm using here for the Bible to be able to follow along with those who are reading with me on YouTube. Um, yeah, so this is where he feeds the four thousand, and we see again his his compassion for the crowd. He has compassion on them because they've been following with him, they've been getting nourished by him, but they're still you know they're physically there's a need. And he's going to not just meet the need for the moment, he meets the need that they're going to have heading back home, right? That there's, there's uh, if you go down to the end, they all ate in verse 37 and were satisfied, and they took up seven baskets full of the broken pieces left over. He didn't just supply for the moment, there was, you know, symbolically, there's perfect provision for what comes next, and this is not just a New Testament thing, right? This is something that we see in the Old Testament as well, right? In the Hebrew Scriptures. We're in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 1 where we see this is where Moses, right? He he goes to free the people of Israel because he's got this, this like, this isn't right. They're in slavery. These are my people. I'm going to free them. We're going to bust out of the land. And he kills the taskmaster. The guys who he saves turn on him. And then the Egyptian government finds out, and they're out to kill him. So he expeditiously takes a trip into the wilderness for a 40-year vacation. <laughs> Not the way you want to do that. He's He's been in exile, basically. And he sees this burning bush. It's burning. It's not being consumed. And he stops by to see it. Uh, verse 7 here. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Prezerites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Sounds great. Sign me up, Lord. We're going somewhere. Let's get out of here. Verse 9, though. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have seen the oppression with which Egyptians oppressed them. Verse 10. Come, and I will send I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Imagine being Moses, just here for a minute, and hearing 
like, hey, I've heard my people. I've heard their cries. I've seen what's going on. And you're thinking like, yeah, it's been like 400 years. Thank you for for hearing us and for seeing what's going on. There may be the, the temptation to think, well, why haven't you done anything? And sometimes we get in that similar spot, don't we? If um, For those of you who are maybe you're meeting with your disciples or you're in your, in your walk with the Lord and your journey with him, sometimes uh, it seems like you've been in a place where I don't feel like my prayers are being answered. It seems like I'm throwing up these prayers, you know, just like, you know, passing off Hail Marys down the, the field. You know, there's a reason it's called that. Um, and it seems like these things, like, like the requests that I'm sending up to the Lord aren't being answered, that when I try to have personal time with him, it just seems dry, like he's not here. Where did he go? Where did I go? How come I'm not feeling him like I used to? Um, Moses, he's out in the desert, Right, he's he's out living with the the Midianites, and he meets the Lord here in a desert place, where he's uh, he's tending these sheep and everything, and he sees this bush; it's not being consumed. Well, why not? We find out that God's there, and He's commissioning Moses. Hey, you know that all that injustice, all of that wrong that you were seeing, and the freedom that you knew these people. Uh, needed and had that was coming to him at some point. Yeah, I've seen that and I'm actually appointing and equipping you to go take them there. Moses has tried and failed. God, that's great, but I tried that, you know, in case in case you were sleeping while that happened. I, did, I tried that 40 years ago and it didn't end up turning out all that well. In fact, in case you've forgotten, Lord, um, that's kind of the reason I'm out here. Uh, I don't. I'm not the guy that you're looking for, right? These aren't the droids you're looking. Uh, Moses trying to tell God, uh, "You've made the wrong choice here. Pick somebody else." God's not lost you, forsaken you, forgotten you. He's doing something through you and in you to bring you to the place. To be the person that he's designed you to be. He's going to take you from a place of, of that where you're feeling that isolation and suffering. And you'll be able to see that he was there with you. And without getting into the ground we've already covered about, about suffering and, and uh, sometimes stone seems like a stone and becomes bread later. Sometimes it's bread for other people. Uh, sometimes it becomes bread to us, but... It takes a while because the Lord's doing something in us that we wouldn't have been able to receive that earlier. Um, there, there's different. You need a theology of suffering, right, to be able to well to engage life. Really, we can talk about a theology of suffering later. But staying on track with what we're doing now here, Exodus chapter three. God sees His people. He's heard their cry, and He moves to answer them by sending. Moses, the guy who is convinced he's not going to do it until, spoiler alert, he does, and some awesome, awesome things happen, right? Now you get to Genesis. You also see in Genesis 16, backing up even further, the story with Sarai and Hagar, right, where uh, Hagar gets sent out from uh, the community, right, Abraham's family, and uh, her and her son Ishmael, they get sent out because... Sarah gets jealous. Sarah gets jealous of her and, and her son, and they're mocking Isaac and everything, and, and she's not happy. Um, and Abraham, he gets told to uh, to uh, send to send her out. So we jump down to verse thirteen. So she called the name of the Lord. She called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God of seeing. For she said, Truly, here I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore, the well was called Be'er Lahai Roy. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. Right? Uh, she takes off. Yeah. She, she takes off. And, uh, and she ends up, God talks to her. He sees her. He lets her know, hey, I see what's going on with you, 
and what kind of what kind of things are being done to you and how you're reacting to these things. I'm going to take care of you. And so then the question is, will we trust him to take care of us? Circling back to Matthew chapter 9, uh, when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were, like, they, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Seeing the things that are going on, but and if you like look at culture today, right? The uh, seeing, you know, the, being black pilled is what I've been hearing it called lately. That you see, oh yeah, sure, we've got all the evidence that things went wrong. We've had all the interviews and congressional hearings and all this and that and other things saying, oh yeah, these things happen. And then when it's time to follow through, a big steaming pile of something is left there, but it doesn't seem like anything's actually happened. Um, bad stuff is going on, and what? Black-pilled. These people are coming to Jesus in a similar state. Uh, seeing everything that's going on around them, people are turning from the Lord. you got the Herodians who are embracing uh, Greek culture and living that just flies in the face of everything that God's Word says that we should do. You've got the Orthodox crowd and, and the priest. Uh, that that are you got the orthodox crowd that's telling everybody here's the law and here's all here and here's all the other the other laws that you need to follow so you don't get close to violating those laws um and there's more and more but there's no assistance with being able to actually like follow through and do more than just be a someone who follows laws like we want a relationship with the lord and then you've got all the way over to the temple Folks who are supposed to be representing the people to the Lord and the Lord to the people, and they're engaged in compromise, right? They're, there's the position of high priest is no longer a a lifelong appointment. It's it's being divvied up and and appointed to people based on whoever has the best campaign for it. Basically, it's like like campaigning for a political office but you're campaigning to be the representative of God to his people like, how is this something that came up to be for sale kind of sounds like our day doesn't it right and through all the mess there's people who are asking Lord what what's going on do you have anything real to offer me that's different than what I'm seeing in politics and in economics and in civics, the way people are treating each other, and in you know national and international affairs and everything, it just it's it, Lord, everything's going to to mess. Where are you in this? And it's in those times that we see things like the outpouring of the Lord that's been going on at Asbury, uh, and that's spilled over to. Ohio uh, Christian University and uh, to the ramp down in in Alabama and I was seeing Indiana Wesleyan and there's a list of I've seen like a short list of 20 colleges that 20 colleges and places that the that the, the Holy Spirit's been moving and pouring out on um, for testimonies from people about healings that have been taking place um, God's on the move Seeing what's going on foreign in foreign countries and stuff like Iran and China, uh, where the church is under extreme persecution and is uh, growing exponentially. In the middle of not understanding why things are going on and what's going on necessarily, the trust in the Lord has not been shaken, and he's proven himself to be the faithful one. What is it that's going on with you? Where is it that the Lord is extending his hand to you saying, hey, I'm the faithful one. Will you trust me? If we can trust the Lord, trust him in our sufferings and with our suffering, uh, whatever it would be, he does not let that trust go void. He is a faithful one. Let him have your heart. Right, Let him have that heart. He's trustworthy. 
and he's the he's the one who will see that all things um he's the one who will like the like the word says his glory will be your vanguard the hills melt like wax in his presence he'll establish your steps that's who he is guys this is brett rogers thank you for being a part of the logos veritas Pro, uh, podcast today please feel free to reach out to me at gmail uh at logos veritas podcast at gmail.com or on youtube uh and facebook also if you'd like to be able to contact me get i uh, be able to talk to me about things to be able to talk more about i'd love to be able to hear from you may the lord bless you and keep you see you guys